What's going on you guys? Welcome back to the channel and today we're going to learn how to build this infinite runner game in Python using Pygame. So as always with a Python Pygame game, first thing you want to do is import Pygame in the very beginning. Um, a ton of what we do for the game functionality is built into the Pygame module. And so you just first thing you want to do is import the package. And um, we'll see why later. But if you're going to have any kind of RNG in your game, which is pretty common, some sort of randomly generated uh, difficulty or enemy spawning or anything like that, I always import the random module as well. Um, you certainly can hold off on that until you actually need it and do it on a case-by-case -case basis, but if you include it as kind of part of your standard package, it'll usually benefit you in the long run. Um, so then the next thing to do is just initialize Pygame. This is saying anything that's inside of the um, inside of the Pygame module, now it's up and running. So the init uh, is the next thing to do. And then um, I like to just create some like uh, game constants. Um, and so this is where I'll put like colors because a lot of the colors in Pygame are RGB fashion. And so if you just want to be able to call white or black instead of RGB typing it out every time, you would just put those here. So for now, I'll just throw a few down. Um, and if we decide later on in the game that we want more, we can come in and add them. And then I'll just make a section here for game variables also. So things like score, um, player positions, enemy positions, things like that. We'll put those in here. And um, if you're following along line by line, you want to make this exact game, go ahead and make player X, player Y, 50 and 200 for now. Um, those will change during the game, but uh, for now that's where we're going to start them. And then two more variables I'm going to make, and I'm going to, or they're not really going to be variables they're going to be constants are going to be screen width and screen height and because they're pretty much going to stay constant um, I'm going to make them all caps that's kind of a normal python standard but you can play around with it if you don't like it um, and so let's go ahead and use those variables we just made uh, width and height and let's go ahead and my indentation is kind of funky let's define our screen so it's going to be this pygame built in pygame dot display dot set mode and then we just give it a size inside of these brackets and so we will do width by height and you could just type in 450 and 300 there if you weren't going to use it anywhere else like you didn't need that as a variable then you could just type them in there that's fine um, I prefer to do it this way and if we ever want to reference something that's exactly the width of the screen then you can do it right there and then uh, python.display.setCaption, this isn't something you have to do, but uh, it gives a title to your window when you open it up. And so since this is just kind of an infinite runner, we will call it infinite runner. I like that. Call it whatever you want. Um, and then I always create a variable for my background. Um, so later on when we do a, a fill command, um, I just reference the background that way. If you do want to load an image in here later, um, or anything like that, you can just come and edit your background variable. Then you always want to define a frame rate, uh, and we'll get into this when we get into the game loop, but you want a speed at the beginning of your game um, that it will run at on any device. And so we're saying 60 frames per second. And um, the last thing that I do initializing everything before actually starting the game loop is I'll define a font because almost every game will include some text. So in this case, we're going to use one of the built-in fonts that comes with your install. So we'll do free sans bold dot TTF, and then we'll give it a size of 16. Uh, and that looks pretty good when I was making this before. And then we'll define a timer, pygame dot time dot clock, okay? And uh, these are the things, basically what you're looking at on your screen right now, I make this, although I'll play around with the width and the height depending on what game I'm making, and these variables will obviously change depending on the game. 
but I basically, this is the frame of every game that you're going to create. And you start, um, you'll use almost everything you see on the screen here in any Pi game game. Uh, and now we'll actually get into the game functionality. So we'll set this variable running equals true. And then we're going to create, this is called the main game loop. And it's just any time we're running. So while running equals true, didn't need a column there. But while running equals true, and then now we're going to start seeing timer.tick at our frame rate. So this is what's actually going to control the speed at which it runs. And we'll do screen.fill with the background. And so you'll see I kind of defined all the variables knowing I was going to need them later. If you were just kind of muddling through this, you'd be jumping back and forth into the loop, realizing you need another variable, going back up and creating it. Um, okay, but now we'll get into um, just kind of the quickest way to get the screen to pop up. And so for event handling, we're going to create for event in pygame.event.get and that's the code to get anything going on your computer clicks mouse position um, buttons that are pressed on the keyboard anything that's pi guy game dot event dot get um, and then we are going to check and see if the if uh, the game is exited out so it's if event dot type is equal to pi game and then the built-in quit which is going to be the the uh, X in the top right screen then we just want to set running equal to false. And so that's going to make sure we don't have an infinite loop. If you start this game up and you don't have any conditions that could end running, then your computer is basically going to error out. Python is going to error out because that's called an infinite loop and that will totally bring your computer down. Um, there's, n there's no processing uh, power capable of doing something infinite yet. Uh, okay, so let's get out of the event handler. Later inside of this event um, code, this for event in Pygame, that's also where we'll put conditions for like jumping and moving the player character. Um, but for now, we just want the screen to open. And so the last thing we're going to throw in here is going to be pygame.display.flip to kind of throw everything onto the screen. And then we'll throw pygame.quit as this very last screen. And we're going to go ahead and run this. And I want to see if I missed anything. We should just get our rectangular screen. It closed right away. Has no attribute time. Aha. That is supposed to be time, not time. All right. So there we go. We just get this boring uh, screen. Nothing going on. But. Uh, we created a window, so let's go ahead and start getting some stuff in the window. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create the floor. So that's going to be just below um, where we fill the screen with the background. I'm going to just draw a rectangular floor um, that will kind of consider the base of the game. So I'm going to just call it a variable floor, and it's going to be pygame.draw.rect. That's the built-in instruction for drawing a rectangle on the screen. You could do it as a line and mess around with line thickness if you want. I think rectangles are kind of easier, um, but if you don't like how I do it, do it your own way. <laughs> so then we'll go uh, for the rectangle. We give it a um, X starting position, Y starting position, and then width and then height. And here you can see because I had a, uh, a width variable for the width of the screen, that if I start at zero and I make it width long, it should span the entire screen. So let's go ahead and run that again. And you can see we just get a big rectangle across the bottom of the screen, but I'm gonna go ahead and call that the floor. I think that looks pretty good. Let's go ahead and draw the player next. Um, so I'll call it player, and we will make it equal to, again, pygame.draw.rect. And now this one's gonna be a little different. We're gonna put it on the screen. We'll make him green so it's really easy to see. And then for those variables, um, we actually want him to be at player X and player Y. So um, those are going to be things that change, right? Player Y is going to change when the player jumps, and player X will change with the arrow keys if you decide to go left and right. Um, so we're going to make those variables rather than constants. Um, but we'll make the size constant. So we'll make him a 20 by 20 rectangle. 
And I can touch on briefly at the end of the video how to pull in an image if you do want that to be like an 8-bit character rather than um, a rectangle. It's pretty easy, but we're going to do it with just built-in shapes because I don't want to assume for this video that you've gone out and pulled in images or anything. Uh, okay, so we can't do anything with him yet, but we do have a little rectangle and he's sitting on a, a runway. And so right there, that's pretty cool. We got the start of our game. Let's go ahead and put in the jumping code because it's kind of simple, but it's actually, um, it, it can get a little confusing. So um, let's go ahead. We're going to need a new section in here if event.type equals, and now instead of checking if it's been um, quit, we're checking for something called key down, which is a key press. Um, and uh, later on, we'll also get into key up, which is key release. But we'll start with key down. And um, we'll check if event.key. So now we're looking to see that the actual key that was pressed is equal to pygame.k underscore space. So that's the built in for the space bar. And then we'll check something else. Um, we're going to check that and y change is equal to zero. And the reason for this is when we do jump, we're going to add a variable to the player's Y condition called Y change. And we want to kind of work like jumping in real life where gravity is going to have a progressive effect. Um, so we're only going to let the space bar do anything um, if you're not actively jumping. So we'll go back up into game variables and we'll call Y change equal to zero initially saying, you know, you will be able to jump right when the game starts up. Um, okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to set y change equal to a value. And I've messed around with this a little bit. I made the game already, and I found 18 worked pretty good. But um, you, can, you can modify it if you want. Um, I like 18, and for now that's what I'm going to go with. And so now let's put in the actual jump logic. And it's going to go like this. It's going to, um, we're going to start by checking to see um, if y change is greater than zero. So now we're checking to see if we have just jumped essentially. Um, or the player is less than 200. And less than might seem weird here, but the actual Pi game coordinate system, I'll open the, oh, it's not going to let me yet. Um, let me just throw pass in here because I want to pull the window up real quick to talk about this. Um, the Less than is not equal. Oh, <laughs> player Y is less than 200. Okay, there we go. Um, I want to talk about this real quick. This point where my mouse is right now in Pygame's coordinate system is 0, 0. So as you go further right, your X coordinate gets larger. But as you go down, your Y coordinate gets larger. So it actually might seem counterintuitive, but if you want this guy to essentially jump, you need to subtract values from the uh, player Y. So when we say we're checking to see if the player Y is less than 200, we're checking to see if he's above the floor, basically. Um, so that took me a while to get that window open, but hopefully that makes sense, and it should make sense once we get this code in there. But basically what we're going to say, this means that Y change is positive. We're going to have the player Y minus equal to y change. So um, when you jump, I'm saying 18. We could make this um, a negative 18, and then you could do plus equals. It doesn't matter. Either way that you do it, you just have to be aware um, of how the coordinate system is going to equal uh, is, is going to work. But then uh, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to add gravity. So that's another game variable I want to have in here. I'm just going to make it equal to 1, but if you want to see the effects of different um, of different gravity, you can play around with that on your own time. Um, so this is saying that while you're actively jumping and going upward, we're going to subtract gravity. So every scan of it, so 60 times per second, we're going to take 1 away from your jump, um, and we're going to subtract gravity. And then this second piece is saying, even while you're still in the air, so when Y change is no longer positive, which means now you're coming back down, um, we are still going to keep subtracting gravity, so you'll progressively fall faster and faster. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. 
But uh, then the next thing we want to check is if somehow, because uh, it, it could happen, if the player Y ever goes greater than 200, meaning it's gone past the floor, um, we're just going to force it back to the floor. So this is just kind of checking for weird conditions where like gravity's going so fast that you're falling 10 or 15 pixels a second. It might, for one scan, take you below the floor. And if we don't put this line in, your block might just get stuck below the floor. So <laughs> include that. Um, and if you don't believe me, you can remove it and see what happens. But then we'll do this other piece where um, we reset Y change. So now we're saying, okay, the player's back on the floor, but Y change is still negative. Um, and then we're going to set our Y change back equal to zero. So that's basically reinitializing you and giving you the ability to jump again. You could also use an intermediate variable called like jumping, set equal to false initially. When you press, press space, set equal to true. Once you land back on the ground, set it back equal to false. Um, that would be another valid way to do the jump logic, but let's just run this and see if we have a good looking uh, jump animation. So yeah, you can see I can do it once, um, but I can't do it over and over again. So what is going on? If player is, oh, I keep doing player. It's got to be player Y. There we go. That's why it's important to uh, run your program uh, fairly often while you're coding it and make sure, there we go. Um, make sure that uh, it behaves as you'd expect it to that far into your routine because um, you catch a lot of little things like that. And if you don't test it fairly frequently while you're writing it, you'll end up at the end of a fairly large program with, 12 things to debug so all right let's go ahead and add left and right motion using the left and right arrow keys um, so again this is going to use more in our key down space we're also going to now add conditions for if event dot key is equal to pi game dot k and then this will be k right and k left okay right Okay, and if it's equal to k right, then we're going to do something called x change, right? We have our y change. Now we're going to do x change. If it's right, we want to go to 2. And I'll just copy this whole thing, and we'll just tweak it for left. And if it's left, uh, we are going to want it to go minus 2. And this is kind of an easy way of handling left and right with one variable. So now I'm going to get rid of the space in here, but we're going to add a new section called pi game key up. So we're checking for the release. And if the left or right key is released, it doesn't matter if it's left or right. We want the character to stop moving at that point. So what we're going to do is down here where we have the uh, player X and player Y changing, um, we, currently we just have the Y change. We're going to add a section for the player X change. And we're going to use some limit conditions because we don't want the player to be able to move off the screen. So we're going to say as long as the player X is greater than uh, e or equal to 0 and less than or equal to 430, right, which are the boundaries because the block is 20 wide. So if he's currently at 430 that means the right edge of it is going to be equal to 450 just a little math for you there um, but in that case we're going to do plus equals x change um, and one thing before I forget we do want to come up into our game variables and we want to create x change as well and we want it to be equal to zero when the game starts so you don't start off sliding one way or another um, and now we're just going to add some stuff as well uh, just on the off chance that you do slide too far off screen to the left, we are just going to put you back to zero, and we'll do the same thing um, on the right. So there are, I mean, you could tweak this statement, get rid of the equals, and do uh, greater than zero, less than 430, but then you can get a problem with, uh, sw like, going back to the right, going back to the left. Um, so if, if you can get it working for you, that's great. Uh, I always add these because the number of times weird stuff happens where you end up one pixel too far to the right and your game just freezes. You can't move. 
Um, so I like adding these boundary conditions, just saying if somehow you go beyond the boundaries, we're going to bring you back into the screen. Okay, so let's go ahead and see. I believe that's all we need for our left and right arrow keys to get us moving. Yep, and we can jump and move left and right. Let's see if we can get off screen. We can't to the left. And honestly, like if you're following along, just once you get to the point where you have a little rectangle that can jump around and move left and right, like it's already kind of fun. <laughs> um, maybe that's just me. But uh, okay, so um, that's pretty good. The next mechanic I want to add is going to be the obstacles. And I've waited till this point because it kind of seems complicated to have like infinite um, obstacles coming at you. And there's a whole bunch of ways that you could do this. So before anyone gets in my comments and says like, oh, well, you should have done this, you should have done that. There are so many ways that you could do spawned enemies you could uh, constantly be creating a list and tracking like new ones whatever you want um, because the game I created uh, really would be too jumbled if it ever had more than three obstacles on the screen at one time I'm gonna create three obstacles I'm gonna have them start in a set position and move from right to left and then once they get off screen left I'm gonna have them randomly select a position somewhere to the right of the screen to spawn in at and uh, I'm gonna have them continually in a loop where if they make it off screen to the left pick a new position on the right and spawn back in and I'm just gonna use three obstacles so uh, that's what we're gonna do here um, I'm going to create another couple colors because I, I kind of like the idea of these guys being like uh, red, orange, and yellow. So I'm going to put those three colors up in here as well. You can grab any RGB values you want um, if you want to follow along. I looked these up ahead of time, and they all look pretty good. Red, orange, and yellow are good bad guy colors if you've ever seen Tron. Okay. All right, and so uh, one more thing I'm going to put in my game variables is I'm going to make a list of obstacles positions, and uh, you'll see why we need this in a second, but this is also going to be where they'll spawn in at. So we'll just go with 300, 450, and 600. That works pretty good for the size we created. I'm going to create another variable, and I'm going to call it obstacle, if I can spell it right. Uh, you could maybe <laughs> call them enemies too if you want because uh, obstacle is kind of hard to spell and I would just give obstacle speed of two to start and let's see that may be all we need for this so okay let's go down into where we draw everything and uh, let's go ahead and draw underneath the player obstacle obstacle actually this is the easiest way to do it let's do four I in obstacles there we go and we will just say pygame dot draw dot rect and we'll put it on the screen mm. no then my then my uh, theory about three colors will not look as sweet so let's go ahead and just do it <laughs> do it this way sorry I'm making game time decision obstacle zero is going to be equal to pygame dot draw dot rect just like the player we're going to put it on the screen and we are going to make this guy red and let's start giving him the coordinates uh, zero is going to be at position obstacles index value zero and then uh, we're going to put it at 200 20 and 20 and those three can be constants because we're not going to make the enemies jump and then I will go ahead and copy this guy and copy this and we'll do obstacle 0, 1, and 2. I started numbering 0, 1, and 2 so that their values would match the indexes um, because a list always starts from 0. Uh, if you don't know that, now you know. But we're going to make them red, orange, and yellow, and all we need to modify is where they start in their X positions. And so this will get them to draw in when we run it, but they're not going to be moving yet. So you can see you can only see red because um, orange and yellow are over here. So let's go ahead and handle the obstacle movement. Um, and this is kind of the best like Python programming bit in this game. 
Um, pretty much everything else is just a little bit of style, a little bit of knowledge of object-oriented programming. But here we're going to be using a for loop, and we're going to say for i in range, and the range is going to be the length of our list of obstacles. So some people say you can do for i in obstacles, and that should work as well. That's true, but I want to be real clear about what I'm checking. Um, and then let's create a new variable and say if active, because we want to plan for if you collide with an enemy, the game ends. And so at the beginning, um, game variables, we'll say active equals true. Okay, and then what we'll say is if you hit an enemy, active is going to become equal to false. So let's go ahead here. If active, what do we want to do? We want obstacles at position i. So this is going to um, update every obstacle in our list's position. And how much do we want to change it by? Well, we want to move it left at obstacle speed. Okay? And so uh, that's it for moving them. But then we also want if obstacles i is less than negative 20. So at that point, the object has moved completely off screen to the left. Well, what do we want to do? I think it's actually easier. So there are two ways you could do it. You could delete it from your list and then add a new value to the list, or you can just overwrite it. Like there's no, there's not going to be some funny business where the object looks really weird going back across the screen to the right. If we just overwrite that entry with a new position. So what we're going to do is we're going to reuse that value obstacles i at whatever index just finished. And we're going to set it equal to random dot rand int. So this is kind of our, our RNG um, piece to the game. And I'm just going to use this range 470 to 570 because that's off screen to the right. Um, and so this is going to kind of affect the spacing a little bit. So they could, in theory, progressively get closer and closer together, further and further apart. Um, it could get a little goofy looking, but uh, we'll see when we play it. These are the sort of variables you can modify as much as you want. Um, and then this is also going to be where we increment the score. So I know we're not displaying that anywhere yet, um, but... Uh, this is once we draw that onto the screen, this is going to be how we handle that. So, okay. So let's do one last thing because we are inside the if active loop. And um, if player dot collide wrecked. And uh, here's where it maybe if I had drawn them in a for loop, this would be a little easier. But we're going to say if player collide wrecked with obstacle zero. And this collide wrecked is a built in Pygame function um, that is uh, automatically checking two rectangles to see if they collide with each other. So because the player and the enemies are both currently rectangles, um, we can just use it. If you were to pull in an image, you would have to also use the pygame.getRect function to get a rectangular um, set of coordinates for your image. It's really easy to do, but uh, since we just are drawing rectangles for everything, then we can just do it like this. Okay, so if player dot collide wrecked obstacle zero, one, or two, um, so that's saying the player just collided with one of the enemies. We're just going to set active equal to false. And so all I think that this will do now is it'll get stuff moving from right to left. I'll try to jump a few here. Yep. And you can see the red guy um, spawns back in, orange, yellow. They're spawning back in, and the spacing is changing a little bit. And we hit, and uh, I can still jump, but you can see the, um, the enemies aren't moving anymore, and the game is stopped. So uh, that's pretty cool. Let's go ahead and draw the score onto the screen as well. Um, I think now's a good time to do that. So... Underneath the screen.fill um, background, and make sure everything's after screen.fill background because this is, as you see it, kind of the order that's going to go in. If you had screen.fill after all of this stuff, um, this is all getting drawn before they, it fills the screen with the color black, so you're not going to see anything. Um, okay, 
So that was a little tangent, but we're going to say score text is equal to, and this is going to be, if you're not familiar with Pygame fonts, if this is the first time you've made a Pygame game, just kind of follow along. Uh, you have to do this font.render before you can actually draw it onto the screen. It's one extra step. Um, but score text is going to be equal to just score, and then um, also the string of our score variable. So I'm going to make this an F string. Uh, if you put that F before your string, that makes it a formatted string, and you can use these curly brackets inside your string um, to display a variable. So little Python hack for you. And then we're going to make it white and with a black background, not that you'll really see the background because the screen is black. And then we are going to screen.blit. So this is saying onto the screen do a, it's block transfer, but dot .blit is the Pygame draw something instruction. And what do we want to draw? We want to draw score text. We want to draw it at about 160 and 250 if you're following along with my dimensions. It looks pretty good there. It'll be about in the center of the screen underneath the floor. So let's go ahead and see if that came up. There we go. And let's see as, yeah, so you can see as blocks do make it off the screen, um, my score does go up. Let's see if I can get a few here. Okay. But one thing you'll notice, uh, we don't have any way of restarting or resetting. So if I hit something... Um, the score is not going to go back to zero, but there's also, there's no way to restart. So we'll add that in now. Um, and we'll add, we'll just make it to where when the game starts, active is actually equal to false. And we will check if, uh, active is equal to false and you press the space bar, then we'll start the game. And that way, spacebar will also be how you restart it if you lost. So what we have to do, though, is we have to add some conditions here. Um, so we'll say all of this is going to be true if active is true. But we'll add something new that says if event.type is pygame.keyDown. And you actually could do that active. Um, you could do that active check on just this rung if you wanted, but uh, I'm going to do it here. And what we'll say is if it's key down and not active and they press the space bar, then what will we do? We'll set active equal to true, but we want to do a few other things because if the player's out of position or the obstacles are out of position, this could get a little goofy. So we are going to go ahead and where are we? Active equals true. Um, we're also going to reinitialize our obstacles and we're also going to put the player's X back to 50. And this is just going to put everyone back in their starting positions. And then one last thing we'll do is we'll set the score equal to zero. Um, so there are a few ways we can pretty this up. We can add some instructions and we can actually display what they need to know onto the screen. But let's go ahead and see if we got the functionality working first. So I'm going to press space. And the game starts. That's pretty sweet. And I die unintentionally. And you can see I hit space once. And I reset the game. And then I can play it again. And the score is resetting. All right. So, I mean, really, this is the end of the video. I mean, we have an infinite runner um, where, uh, you know, the game... Uh, can be played and restarted and it keeps track of score. A few cool things um, just off the top of my head that I think would take this game to the next level. You would want to track high score, um, which you would just check at every time that you died. Essentially, every time you had that collide with the rectangle right there, you would check if your current score was higher than whatever your previously stored highest was and you would move the value into that highest score before you cleared out current score. Um, let's go ahead and do one last thing, just when it's not active, let's go ahead and draw a few things on the screen. 
um, we'll draw, so we'll take this text that we have here, the score text, and we'll say if not active. We're also going to call this one instruction text. And we'll just have it say space bar to start. And this guy, we're not going to want it 162.50. We'll put this guy a little bit higher and a little bit to the left because he's a different length. And let's do one more. Um, we'll just call it instruction text 2. You got to change it in here as well. Instruction text and instruction text 2. And the second one will have spacebar, jumps, left, right, moves. Okay. And we'll put this guy just a little bit below. So that was at 50. We'll put this guy down at 90. Let's take a look how that looks. So we start it up. So uh, you can see that doesn't look great. We'll move it to the left a fair bit here, maybe over to 80. Um, clearly going off script now. But let's run it like that. Okay, I like that. Space bar to start. Space bar jumps, left, right moves. So we're not just throwing the player in there with no instructions. And then you can play. You can get a few points. You could get millions of points if you wanted because the game... Uh, doesn't get progressively more difficult. One thing that you could do, I've done it in a few other videos, um, is progressive difficulty where you kind of use the score as a multiplier for the speed. So, for example, you could do score divided by 10 equals um, obstacle speed. And that way, like every time you hit uh, a new increment of 10 or 20, whatever increment you wanted, you could make it to where the objects actually get faster and faster and faster and that would be a good way of making it difficult as you got higher scores um, for me I just think it's one of those like you're gonna lose focus at some point so this is uh, good for me and good for the tutorial um, but that really is uh, the entire instructions I mean if you followed along I hope you're having fun playing this game because honestly I just made it to make an instructional video but I have a blast playing this now it's kind of addictive and uh, if you did decide to make it and you did take it another step further and do something unique with yours let me know in the comments below what you did to uh, improve it because I'd love to hear uh, your thoughts on what makes this really an even better game and I hope you found it useful if there's anything in particular you have questions on just let me know about that in the comments below as well and I'll get back to you as soon as I can and uh, be sure to check out the channel for a ton of other Python tutorials we've done apps using Kivi we've done applications using tkinter um, we've done a ton of just Python tutorials where you don't need a graphical user interface and HMI portion um, so be sure to check out the channel if you're looking for more content. And uh, if there's an idea that you want to see in a future video, let me know about that one as well in the comments. And uh, maybe you'll see it on the channel pretty soon. If you do like the channel, be sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel. It helps me out a ton. We're a pretty new channel. And uh, I really appreciate all the support. And as always, good luck with your code and thanks for watching. Thanks. Bye.